Great. Well, it's so great to be here. Good afternoon. I have always been fascinated with life stories. And even as a kid, I, I was the biography nerd, tearing through pages of Walter Payton and Wilma Rudolph and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Well, OK, so I was a sports geek, too. <laughs> but, but what jumped off the page as these athletes revealed their road to greatness, hmm, greatness isn't born, it's made. And so what I discovered is I needed to know what it was. What were the ingredients? What was the pathway, the process to greatness? And each story begins in childhood. But whether the road is rocky or smooth at the start, doesn't every child deserve the opportunity to write her own story of becoming great? And what role does our education system play in their story? Now, there's a most interesting narrative about a set of cohorts born in the 50s and 60s, school-aged children, that saw their outcomes get improved dramatically with one of the great social experiments of inclusion in our country, the implementation of school desegregation. And what I want to put forth is when we think about beginning a new school year and now approaching the 60th anniversary of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision, I think it's fitting to reflect back on the efficacy of the various strategies that have been used to promote educational opportunity, equal educational opportunity. And when I look back and over the last four decades, there have been three major government interventions that have dramatically influenced the provision of school resources and have substantially narrowed black-white differences in access to school quality. First among them, school desegregation. Second, school finance reform. And third, is, a, is one of the focuses here, early child education programs and their expansion, for example, through Head Start. And when you look at those three strategies, one involves redistributing school children. The other involves redistributing money. One focuses on race. The other focuses on resources. Yet what's common about the approaches is their aim and goal to ensure access to school quality for the very disadvantaged children from preschool to K through 12. And a lot of research on inequality often suffers from a lack of sufficient historical analysis. When, for example, when you look at the black-white achievement gap, it narrowed substantially during the 70s and 80s, but it's been stagnant since. Today I want to put forth that an eye back can provide an eye forward into the possibilities of schools to be engines and vehicles to upward mobility. And so I want to inject a historical analysis of childhood conditions to trace the root of attainment differences by race and parental socioeconomic status. And so I'm going to shift the spotlight to desegregation. And it's worth mentioning at the outset that court-ordered school desegregation has been described as the most ambitious and controversial social experiments of the past 50 years. And many view the effort to end segregated education and put white and black children in the same classroom as the most radical and far-reaching aspect of the civil rights movement. And, and yet, there was no large-scale data collection effort put forth to try to estimate what impacts these school desegregation effects might have. And so, in fact, the 50th anniversary of the Brown decision, they commissioned a set of legal scholars to put and compile an entire case inventory of every known court-ordered school desegregation case. Uh, Brown University <clears throat> was one of the folks that, that did that, and I was able to acquire that 
that data. And the purpose was to try to learn something about what was happening then that point the way to solutions that we may not be doing today or not be maybe doing enough of. And so that's where I'm going to turn. And to do this, I needed to meld together uh, all of the available archival information of school districts across the country and then match that with a set of individuals that have been traced from childhood to adulthood. And, and, and what that provided, the use of the panel study of income dynamics is what researchers know it as, but it's become America's family tree in the sense that this is a data set that spans, it's the longest running panel, nationally representative data set in the world, and it spans four decades, and the genealogical and dynastic design enables the linking of generations of individuals from childhood to adulthood. And that's the data that I'm going to use to present to summarize some of the insights that we get looking back and what it says about the promise of schools affecting larger change. So uh, first, a little history. And the, the important thing is that the Brown was just the Brown decision was just the beginning, and that the actual rollout of school desegregation implementation was very slow moving. When we look back at 1952, and we look at where we were, and the regional pattern of where legal segregation was required, this is where we started. And so you clearly see both the concentration of legal segregation in the South, but also where the poverty was concentrated and where blacks were concentrated. Now, I love the way Walter Gilhorn, a legal scholar, described the pace. The pace of desegregation in these first decade was that of one of an arthritic, uh, uh, extraordinarily arthritic snail. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of what you see, you know, 10, 10 years later. But by 1970s, the 64 to 68, there was a huge acceleration of desegregation activity. By 75, the South was more integrated than any part of the country. And, and so the key thing is that this timing and the wide variation in both the intensity as well as the uh, implementation style of desegregation permits a researcher to go back in time and look at that timing to demonstrate whether that impacted the timing of subsequent educational outcomes. Now, when you think about desegregation and whether it can affect later life outcomes, there's three mechanisms I want you to have in mind. One is the way in which it may have affected school <clears throat> quality, okay? And there's three mechanisms. One is the way it may have affected school resources. That is the distribution level per pupil spending, class size, teacher quality. The other piece is maybe peer effects. There's a whole literature about how peer effects influence in the racial integration. And then the third is the way it may have affected teacher, child, community level expectations for child achievement and hope and the way that it might have affected investment. Now, this picture I always feel like brackets my parents and myself. That is, those born in the late 40s, most blacks in the late 40s grew up in completely segregated environments throughout their school age years. Whereas those born in the early 70s, the majority of black children grew up in districts that were under some kind of desegregation plan. Okay? And so that's that timing. The first question is, how did it affect school quality? Or did it? And the question in the answer is a resounding yes. Now, the key thing is that it's not just that it affected racial integration, which we do see that in the classroom, when you look at racial integration, there was a dramatic increase in black-white exposure in the classroom and the uh, 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 proportion of black children that had white teachers, et cetera. You see that precisely at the timing with the plan implementation. But there's two key non-racial aspects of integration that get overlooked, and that is the way it affected school quality. That is, prior to desegregation, the majority of school resources, particularly in the South, were directed toward majority all-white schools. And so what that meant was with integration, there had to be a merging of the resources. And what the states did was actually infuse dollars, particularly to those districts, at the precise moments that they were desegregating to make sure that the level of resources for blacks would be leveled up to the level that whites were previously getting. And you see this $1,000 increase in per-pupil spending in those districts. Okay? And you only see it 
in districts that had a significant black population. And it's not accounted for by anything else that was concurrent with this, this period. Okay? Now, the key thing is, what did that mean? It me meant more resources, and it meant that whites were basically left in the same situation in terms of resources, but blacks experienced dramatic declines in class size. And what does that mean? Well, that frames what the policy was itself. Now we're going to move forward to talk about what the actual attainment for the children themselves. But when you look at a four-person decline in class size, when you look across other large-scale educational interventions, you're hard-pressed to find another educational intervention that had this dramatic in impact on, on school resources. So the next thing is we look at educational attainment. Again, linking cohorts born between 1945 and, and born through 1945 and 1968 who've been followed into adulthood. And what you see, again, no effects for whites. What you're going to see throughout these results is there was a lot of concern that integration was going to cause negative impacts for whites, and that that was a major fear and concern. What the results demonstrate is the red line de demarcates basically people who were never exposed to the left of that line, and to the right, it represents the number of years of exposure of desegregation up to 12 years, and then anything beyond that just means that it happened you know, prior to the time that you were five years old. And so the, the point is that you see no pre-existing time trend leading up to the point at which the desegregation was implemented. And then you see uh, in the program evaluation literature, we, we use the medical parlance of treatment. So there's a dose response. And here the dose is the, the number of years of exposure. In, in this case, the treatment is desegregation. But the potency of the treatment is also influenced by the actual change in school resources that accompanied school desegregation. We try to look at that in concert. So what you see is there's a dose response. That is, the number of years of exposure leads to a commensurate increase in the likelihood of high school graduation, up to the point where it's about a 15, about a three percentage point increase in the likelihood of graduating high school with each additional year of exposure. Okay, so that translates into almost a 30 percentage point change in the likelihood of graduating from high school. When you look at the educational attainment, you see a similar significant narrowing of the black-white educational attainment gap. And when you look at over time, in, for this period, the results imply that school desegregation played the dominant role in narrowing black-white educational attainment for, for these cohorts. Now, one thing that you want to have in mind is that the 1960s was a miracle in policymaking, okay? So you not just had school desegregation, you had the desegregation of hospitals. You also had the Lyndon Johnson War on Poverty Initiatives with Head Start, community health centers, expansion of food stamps. I mean, I could go on and on, but the point is that this analysis is taking all of those coincident policy uh, expansions into account and their timing, which all independently have important effects. But these are isolating the effects of desegregation outside of those things, where you're looking at two individuals born in the same environment, same neighborhood, same school district. The only difference is that one grew up a little, was born a little earlier, and so they went through a segregated environment for the more of their childhood years. And then we, what, trace out the subsequent impacts, okay? Now, criminal involvement is usually we focus on education outcomes. But what I want to make a point is that our best preventative antidote to criminal involvement is quality education. Okay? And what you see here is when you look at outcomes like the likelihood of incarceration, again, no pre-existing time trend, but even in an era of the war on drugs happening later for these cohorts, you still see for this cohort a dramatic d decline in the likelihood of incarceration with each additional year of exposure to desegregation. Similarly, when you look at career outcomes, by career outcomes I mean, think about it. Today, we normally reduce our evaluation of school systems by test scores. But if we had long-term outcomes, what would, we use, what would we like to use? We'd like to use labor market returns. We'd like to use your adult earnings, your success in the labor market, those kinds of outcomes. Well, we can do that with these, with these data, right? So you look at occupational attainment. And again, no effects for whites, that is its level. It's not that their attainments aren't increasing secularly over time, but not associated with desegregation exposure, but for blacks, a significant narrowing of those occupational attainment gaps. 
And then when you look at adult earnings, again, dramatic increases uh, that, that translate into an additional 5% in increase in annual earnings with each year of exposure to school desegregation. Okay? No effects for whites. And that translates into substantial reductions in the annual incidence of adult poverty and, and other outcomes that are of interest. And even though I'm not going to present it today, we also see that this translates into significantly improved health, where individuals are seven years uh, younger than their counterparts are because of the school desegregation intervention. Now, the last set of pieces that I'll put to this puzzle is the legacy generation to generation. And here, all of these individuals are now in their 40s and 50s, and all have, most of them have their own children. So we can link this now to what the educational and performance has been of the children of those cohorts born between 1948 and 68 who are born sometime after 1980, okay? And what you see is no effects for whites, but a significant increase in the performance for blacks. So in sum, I want to say that why these outcomes, resources or peer effects, what the research says is that it's the school resources that played the dominant role in explaining these patterns. That is, very minimal effects when the racial school segregation was accompanied by minimal changes in school quality. And so in sum, the story is not that a superior set of peers influenced the outcomes for uh, uh, the bettering the outcomes of another set of peers, but rather that the keys of access open the door to resources and that those keys should be securely placed in the hands of every child. And denying children access to those keys damages both their educational and later life outcomes. But when the doors of access are flung open, and the rivers of opportunity flow to the resources that were once denied to those individuals, we see a great upswing in outcomes. And with that, I'll close.